Thank you, Richard. Uh, in up Cree Chief uh, Ron Morin, if Ron is still here, and Master of Ceremonies uh, Rick Harp, and uh, honored organizers and guests. Uh, I'm very, very grateful for this opportunity to come and speak to this uh, prestigious gathering. It, it is uh, uh, an experience that uh, already means uh, a lot to me. And I'm particularly thrilled, really, uh, to be introduced by uh, Richard Isaac. Now, we've had many thousands of distinguished volunteers, not just from Canada, but from all over the world, uh, come here uh, and, and work as, as partners with First Nations hosts on, on seriously needed housing and other projects. And uh, it, uh, it was just a great surprise uh, to have this invitation from, from Richard and to see him again after all of these years. But uh, I have to say, and I hope he won't mind me saying this, he, he is probably the most uh, creative and innovatively productive volunteer that we've ever had in, in our history. And uh, I'm going to start this afternoon's presentation by uh, talking about this uh, first scene that you see here. And uh, I wanted this to be a surprise for you, <laughs> Richard. But this is the Heart Lake School. And Richard only arrived here in the early 80s, but very soon he came up with all kinds of appropriate designs in which the people themselves could take part in uh, turning into reality. And uh, here's, a, here's another uh, splendid project that, uh, that Richard designed, the Wabasca Recreation and Sports Center. Um, and uh, I remember at the opening day, people were saying, hey, this building grew here. And indeed it did, because that building was built of logs that were harvested from spruce standing uh, close by. And uh, with the use of our, our Woodmiser portable sawmills, and uh, uh, Richard and other uh, uh, architectural and, and engineering volunteers, as well as a great uh, crowd of local volunteers, we were able to turn that dream into reality. Unfortunately, uh, some years later, a fire um, consumed that, that project. So we were sad that that happened. And uh, some of you are familiar with with fire departments like the Wabasca Fire Department, which is somewhat slower than the speed of light. Uh, uh, <clears throat> before I get into the Canadian activity, I'll mention to you that <clears throat> we are uh, active internationally, and uh, we've been busiest in the two poorest countries in the hemisphere, Haiti and Bolivia. And uh, this was the first project that we undertook in Haiti. It was a, a new school to replace the best school in the community, which was a, just a total disaster. The second floor would still be used, and there were holes in that second floor that you could easily fall through if you weren't careful. But yet the kids in that school, even though they had no paper or pencils, were singing hymns, and, and they were so happy, uh, just with broken pieces of, of slate and chalk. And I, uh, at the time, uh, I don't cry easily, but I cried. I hadn't seen anything that heartbreaking, even in our years in Africa. And I said, yes, Frontiers will, will help you. And uh, we were involved in a full range of development projects in Haiti, uh, river crossings like this, and uh, extending the road network for their economic future. They had to have attention given to the roads which were constantly being washed out. And thanks to Alberta Aid and the Wild Rose Foundation, we were able to get heavy equipment donated to improve these roads. Uh, we also spent a lot of time on uh, agriculture, and uh, that's a Lucina nursery. This is an amazing tree, the Lucina tree, being promoted by the United Nations. It uh, grows so fast it can be cropped uh, for charcoal in 18 months and lumber in three years. But uh, 
it puts nitrogen in the soil. It fertilizes the soil. So we were able to intercrop it with, with vegetables and peanuts even. And uh, it was a very, very uh, encouraging aspect of our activity there. But of course, Haiti is just plagued with one disaster after another, like hurricanes, f uh, floods, cholera, uh, constant uh, catastrophes like that. But despite all that, these courageous people that we are proud to partner with are able to continue building on hope. And there's the, the, the latest project. It's a new school there. And that school was designed for 250 kids. Unfortunately, because of the earthquake, uh, there were 256 new kids, refugees from Port-au-Prince, that had to go to school too. So we restructured the the school day and the refugee kids uh, became students in the afternoon school and the original enrollment in the morning school from from dawn till noon, the afternoon school from noon till dusk. So now there's 556 kids getting an education there. There, there you see the original enrollment. And here's the heroine of it all, Madam Lisette Kazmir. What a brave, wonderful lady and one of the partners overseas and here in Canada that we've uh, worked with to put a whole lot of good news over these nearly 50 years we've been in existence. We've also worked in Bolivia, uh, building mostly uh, desks and, and furniture for the schools on the high plateau. Here you see uh, elders uh, signing reception of the new furniture. Now coming to Canadian project activity, um, earlier in the day, uh, there was a lot of mention of Attawaska, uh and it, it deserves all the publicity it continues to get. But we've been working in many communities in worse conditions than Attawapiskat, and like like what you see here, see here, this is Kitkasagik in northern Quebec, just south of Val d'Or, and uh, these are Algonquin people, and. They want to keep living there. The government wants them to move somewhere else where there'd be a better hydro connection. But they want to keep uh, on living where they've lived and where there's good fishing. And uh, unfortunately, uh, there was no help uh, being offered by the province or the feds for them. So <clears throat> we did say, hey, we'll partner with you. And <clears throat> we were able. Uh, to place two of our Woodmiser portable sawmills, just the same kind of sawmills that uh, helped uh, Richard in his project um, at uh, Wabaska uh, so many years before. And those uh, Woodmisers have been a great blessing to us. Here you see uh, scenes at the, the training session for the operators. <clears throat> and uh, they're, they're really quite remarkable machines. Uh, these are LT40s, uh, one of the bigger and better ones, and uh, we had, had two of them placed there. You can see the size of log we were able to, to handle there. Um, in that area, uh, there was no uh, power, electric power available for us, and of course we have to um, make sure that our lumber is dried to code, so we designed the shelters for the, for the lumber so that the prevailing wind would dry them uh, down to the moisture coefficient of uh, 22%. And there you see a before and after uh, shot of uh, some of the new housing there in Kitkasagik. And uh, uh, the word sustainable has been used a lot. Uh, a good uh, component of successful sustainability, of course, is participation. And in all our activity, there has been absolute maximum local participation. And uh, uh, here you see uh, the new house of Jean-Paul Panasway in Kitkisagik uh, with the lights on. And uh, Jean-Paul is a, a very proud man today. A couple of years ago, he was discouraged. He had uh, substance abuse problems and uh, kind of a defeated fellow, but now he's a very, very proud Algonquin. He's learned to operate a Whitmiser portable sawmill and he's living in a new home he helped build himself. And uh, here you see some uh, shots of the, the shelters that we built for, for our portable Whitmisers there. 
and uh, there's a couple of scenes showing some of the volunteers we had done that project uh, one from from France and uh, of course in that area the Algonquins uh, speak more French than English so that was appropriate we had another uh, Algonquin from another uh, Algonquin community as a volunteer and <clears throat> speaking of Algonquins the most outstanding Algonquin that we've ever known is Lilas Polson and uh, you you see him there with uh, Sean Atlio, the Grand Chief of the Assembly of First Nations at the World Indigenous Housing Conference in, in Vancouver. But uh, Lilas has been just so uh, effective working with people. Um, he's not just a great builder, he's a motivator. I remember his first project. <laughs> I, I'm generally a, an optimistic person, but I didn't see how it could work because so many in the in the community had alcohol problems, but but uh, Lila's got everybody on the wagon, and the project finished very successfully. That was in Wagashik, Ontario. And uh, here's another shot of Lila's with uh, emergency architect leaders. Uh, we were in Kitkisagin partnership with the Algonquin community under uh, Chief Adrian there, but also with these emergency architect people. Um, so Lilas uh, trained people on operating the mills, supervising construction of the first homes, uh, but the designs were finalized by uh, emergency architects and we uh, made sure, of course, that everything was built according to code there. And uh, there's another shot of Lilas at the housing conference. Further west in Collins, Ontario, uh, we worked uh, with, not with the Algonquins, with the Ojibwa community there, and uh, here we we brought in an LT40 a Woodmiser portable mill. Um, the people themselves harvested their their logs. They, these were uh, all uh, logs taken from their own spruce forest. And uh, we did get cooperation there with the Ministry of Natural Resources in some communities. That that's a challenge, but we we were successful there. And uh, here you see. Um, Chief Angela Frank at, at Collins with with our trainees there in in our project activity we we try to combine the construction of homes with on-site skill training right from safe felling and chainsaw operating uh, to skidding to our portable mills then of course after the lumber is dried we, we go to foundations and framing and finish up with uh, with, uh, with with all the final uh, painting and, and landscaping and everything else. At Collins, uh, Skidder broke down, so we had to use skidoos for a while to get the logs there. Uh, there's our wonderful wood miser. And now that the job's finished there, uh, we were able to take that wood miser uh, over to the Caribou in BC, and it's on a, a new project there. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a minute. And here you see quickly the, the series of uh, modules in, in our activity. First the, the harvesting, and then the skidding and milling, and then the framing, and here you see a finished home. This is at Saugeen, uh, Manitoba, and uh, some of you may have seen this project on, on APTN, the Aboriginal People Television Network. Um, I guess I could say this, Bill, <laughs> part of the, the APTN production was a contrast between the <laughs> disappointing uh, short life of, of too many government housing projects compared with the long life of, of so many of, of our projects. Um, and uh, I guess we can boast a little bit houses um, in uh, Chetwin, B.C. that we worked on uh, in 71 and 72, I look now as good as ever, still lived in with the people who helped build them. And we do know that our style is the way I wish the government had, had gone a long time ago. There you see some of our trainees uh, graduating in Manitoba, in that project. Uh, <clears throat> we've had, of course, an academic component so that the trainees uh, know how to be successful in measurements. And 
<laughs> when we get desperate sometimes we have to even use a horse as has been done here and there and uh, anything to get the job done um, we have uh, worked on a complete range of, of housing styles we've done uh, of course stick frame we've also done uh, square timber uh, horizontal log of course and vertical log and uh, wood frame everything really most of our foundations are because they're in the, in the north are are, are just very basic um, foundations the footings really uh, it's just impossible to to build full basements uh, although in some cases we have we're, we're further south and here's some of the finishing work uh, we've uh, had some great volunteers not only architects like Richard and uh, some of his German buddies <laughs> they were they were all ter terrific volunteers and uh, I uh, I, I have to say that nobody worked harder than the Germans and uh, when we had a particularly tough project I enjoyed giving it to the Germans and hearing them uh, comment Charles we can do it the days are long but we can work till 10 o'clock you know we came here to work so I said go ahead especially the German girls they they, they got upset with me if I didn't keep them working anyway uh, we had also great uh, plumbers and electricians, even from from some of our Caribbean projects, where we'd help them with with activity down there. And uh, there's some of our graduates in uh, on one of the Manitoba projects at Garden Hill. There's the uh, completed unit soggy that was shown on the APTN feature. <clears throat> I mentioned earlier about the help we had from Canadian National um, when we finished the project at Collins. Uh, we had to move that LT40 <laughs> over to the Caribou. And fortunately, Collins is on the CN main line. So is Williams Lake in BC, where we needed that sawmill. So we have some good friends at CN, and they said, Charles, we can do that for you. So they, they picked up the, uh, the mill at Collins for us and took it all the way over to Williams Lake, and, and no charge, and also gave us a nice $10,000 donation. And. Uh, here, coming back to Ontario, uh, I think it's important that you might take note of the fact that we don't work just in remote areas. Here, here's, here's a project right on the doorstep of Ottawa, just about 35 miles away at Lanark, near Smith Falls. And there's a family there, an Algonquin mother, a handicapped father. They had five kids. They'd been living in that wreck for 16 years and uh, so many people saying well somebody should do something and of course when we found about about it we said hey let's all do something and uh, we were able to get uh, a lot of people pitching in locally the family itself the handicapped father managed to do most of the plumbing himself all the electricians were donated we only had to pay one person the supervising carpenter and uh, everything else really was discounted or donated. And uh, here you see the finished project, Pat and Laura Kemp's new, new home. And uh, it was just about 18 months ago this home was uh, open to great uh, celebration. We've done three projects like that right on Ottawa's doorstep, hoping they would notice. And Bill, we even invited some CMHC people to see one of them. And uh, he said, hey, uh, Charles, you did that for 90000 it would have cost us twice that. And I said, yes, you're right. <laughs> anyway, and we got our 2,000 certificates for two of them. So, um, now, <laughs> this isn't a housing project. This is an F-35. I guess uh, most of you probably heard of these monsters. Just about exactly one year ago, Frontiers Foundation, with the blessing of the Assembly of First Nations and many Native and political leaders, not the Conservative Party leaders, but the Liberal and NDP representatives, all came out with a strong Algonquin contingent especially, and um, waved about signs saying, Mr. Harper, Frontiers can build 1,565 safe warm homes for the price of one of these things that nobody needs. We've had no response to date, but we made a mistake. 
Sunday before last on the fifth estate, CBC mentioned that these things now actually don't cost fifteen hundred and sixty-five million. It's two hundred million that they cost each. So I would appeal today that if any of you have the power to convince your MPs to persuade Mr. Harper to uh, make sure that we don't get into this contract on that same fifth estate program. Uh, they've been in touch with Lockheed Martin and Lockheed says the order for 65 still stands. So somebody better stop it and turn this, this very seriously sinister contract into all the good news that we could do with those billions, the, uh, the kind of things that Chief Ron was talking about this morning, things that are so overdue. And while I've still got a few more minutes, I do want to uh, mention a couple of other aspects that our foundation has been promoting for many years. Um, on your tables there, you will see on page 10, a picture of our president, Lawrence Gladue. There he is. There. Now, Lawrence is the president of Frontiers Foundation, and for about, gosh, nearly 20 years now, we have been pleading with, with the federal government and with the people at Rideau Hall for at last to have a native governor general for Canada. They keep choosing Haitian and Chinese and Ukrainian and Anglo and Franco. They're all great people, but they cannot seem to see the Cree and the Blackfoot and the Mohawk and the Ojibwe and Algonquin, some wonderful people. Like Lawrence, he's got all the qualifications. He's a native Albertan, that's one of the best ones. Former Alberta rodeo rider champion, licensed multi-engine bush pilot, university graduate, speak French, English, and Cree, and he's a great fun guy. Why is there this apparently deliberate passing over of the first Canadians? The people who should have been first have been last. Another point that should be made is that here on the bicentennial celebration of the War of 1812, Mr. Harper has spent, I believe, $30 million to date. Wouldn't it have been great if part of those 30 millions could have been used to build a statue at Queenston Heights, a little bit taller than one to General Brock? There's a 180-foot statue to General Isaac Brock, richly deserved, but there should be one a little bit higher higher to Chief Tecumseh, who saved Canada from the invading Americans, who recruited native people on both sides of the border from as far west as, as, as Sioux country. And uh, this hasn't happened. There's just an 18-inch boulder saying Indians in the War of 1812. It doesn't even mention Tecumseh. Then there's an eight-foot memorial to General Brock's horse. So there are a lot of things that that need attention by us. And I hope today that all of us will do all we possibly can to put those things first that have been last for so long. Thank you, bye.